think we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, I just want to start off and say hello to everybody, and I want to welcome you to today's presentation, Promoting Mental Health in the Workplace During COVID-19, Practicing Acceptance and Mindfulness. My name is Evan Carl, and I am the Senior Capacity Building Manager at NYC Service. Uh, we are incredibly proud to feature some amazing trainers from the Mayor's Office of Thrive NYC, who are going to be conducting for you today the second of three trainings that we have going on this month focused on trauma-informed management practices in the age of COVID-19. So as most of your organizations are either managing volunteers or working to build out volunteer programming, we wanted to be sure that we were able to provide these trainings free of charge as the situation with COVID-19 has highlighted not only the importance of volunteers and bolstering organizations capacity during these difficult times, but the importance of being thoughtful about the way trauma from either the pandemic, recent events in the political realm, and other situations impacts volunteers as well as staff members at your organizations. So over the course of these trainings, you're likely going to hear presenters discuss how trauma may inform your management of staff, uh, though we want to be sure uh, to highlight that the takeaways from these trainings also apply to your management of volunteers, the ways in which you guys conceptualize and implement your programming, and how both volunteers and the staff overseeing said volunteers, be that either you or other staff from your organization, approach working with clients across the city. So one final housekeeping piece for me and uh, whoever's in charge of the slides can go ahead to the next one. Uh, we are very, very proud to offer interpretation services for today's presentation in three languages requested from registrants. That's Spanish, Urdu, and Haitian Creole. So if you're interested in listening to a simultaneous uh, uh, translation of today's workshop, please be sure to call the relevant number and use the meeting ID that corresponds with your preferred language on the screen. We're also going to post these conference lines in the chat for anybody who arrives late. Um, so once you guys are on the correct line, you'll just have to be sure to mute yourself uh, so that you can allow others to hear the translation and then turn down the volume of the English language presentation via Zoom so that you can hear. Uh, and I'm going to throw it over to my colleague, Jessica, who is going to give that same announcement uh, in Spanish. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, everybody. The next message will be given in Spanish, offering interpretation services. Para las personas que deseen escuchar esta reunión o presentación del día de hoy en interpretación simultánea, por favor, marque desde sus teléfonos la línea de interpretación al número 646-576-3464. O el 212-788-7444 y el ID 51487, símbolo numeral. Nuevamente, el número es 646-576-3464 o el 212-788-7444 y el ID de la conferencia 51 487, símbolo numeral. Si usted desea permanecer en esta reunión de Zoom en su computador, por favor ponga silencio o baje el volumen de su computador y marque desde sus teléfonos para escuchar la interpretación simultánea. Nuevamente el número es 646-576-3464, el ID 51487, símbolo numeral. Gracias. Thank you. Thank you. And next we have Mobin, who will be giving the announcement for the conference lines uh, in Urdu. Uh, Mobin, are you there? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Hello? Yes, we can hear you. Yeah, it got unmuted. It got uh, muted. Sorry. All right. Uh, जी अस्सलाम वालेकुम मैंने बताना था आप लोगों को कि आज की इस इवेंट के लिए आप लोग फोन नंबर डायल कर सकते हैं 6465673464 या फिर 2127887444 और उसके बाद आप अपना जो आईडी है इस मीटिंग की आईडी नंबर वो एंटर करेंगे जो है 8080792 और ये इवेंट जो है ये आप आप लोगों को दिया गया है ताकि आप आप लोग अपनी जबान में सुन सुन सके आज के जो इस इवेंट में जिस बारे में बात करनी है जो कि मेंटल हेल्थ के बारे में है इसलिए आप लोगों के लिए सहूलत फ्राम की गई है ताकि आप अपनी जबान में सुन सकें इसको 
और सुनने के लिए आप अपना जो टेलीफोन है उसका वॉल्यूम या तो बंद कर दीजिए या बिल्कुल आहिस्ता कर दीजिए अपने कंप्यूटर पे ताकि आपको आवाज ठीक से आ सके आपके फोन से और ताकि दूसरे लोग भी आपको सुन सके साफ साफ तरीके से शुक्रिया थैंक यू Wonderful. And finally, we have Emmanuel who will be giving this announcement in Haitian Creole. Uh, yes. Hello. Yes, we can hear you, Emmanuel. Okay. Et si nous voulons tant des interprétations, présentation aujourd'hui en langue créole haïtien, s'il vous plaît, au poil pèse ou par l'entrée numéro de téléphone que Mbaro a avec au poil utilisé numéro identification rendez-vous qui correspond à langue qui c'est créole. Pour plus meilleurs résultats, s'il vous plaît, descendez le volume là sur ordinateur avec mettez téléphone au son mute pour qu'à permettre l'autre monde tendez interprète là vraiment clair. Pour l'encre au laïcien numéro que vous avez fait c'est 6 46 576 34 64 ou bien si ligne ça pas travail ou relais numéro 212 788 74 44 et numéro identification rendez-vous qui c'est meeting ID c'est 44 859 après ça va peser pound Great. Thank you so much, Emmanuel. Uh, and with that, I uh, just want to remind everybody to call into the language lines if they'd like to hear an interpretation of today's presentation. Uh, thanks again for joining. And with that, I'm just going to hand the mic over to my colleagues, Rachel and Christopher, who are going to begin. Thanks again, all. So good afternoon, everybody. Thank you again. We're happy to have you with us. My name is Christopher Linlogue. I'm on the Thrive in Your Workplace team. This is the Promoting Mental Health in the Workplace During COVID-19, Practicing Acceptance and Mindfulness. And so uh, some of you were with us last week. We're happy if you, if you were able to return. Some of you, this is your first time with us, and we're happy to have you here. So a little bit about Thrive in Your Workplace, the program that we work for. So Thrive in Your Workplace is a public-private partnership that works with local employers to integrate mental health support in the workplace. We do that in a one-to-one -one consultative manner with the employers that we work with uh, to develop customized recommendations for their workplace as it relates to workplace mental health programming and strategies that they can implement to support their workers, their employees, their colleagues, their volunteers, whoever, right? Everything that we do, we offer for free, such as this training, partly because as I mentioned, we're a public-private partnership and we are housed in the mayor's office of Thrive NYC. I see a little bit of, I see a couple questions. The slides will be available from this presentation after the presentation. Next slide, please, Rachel. So uh, as we begin, I wanna go over a couple of housekeeping slash ground rules, really expectations for our time together. Um, your video and your audio is off during the webinar. We have our colleagues at NYC Service who are trying to go through and you know make sure that you are on mute and your video is off. But please do us the courtesy of partaking in that on your own. Um, we've been on virtual calls and virtual meetings. We know how uh, distracting background noise or videos can be if you are indeed not presenting. So please check to make sure that you are mute and that your video is off, right? Um, the chat, which you all have been using, introducing yourselves, very nice, will also be used for question and answer. At the end of our presentation, there will be time for uh, for us to answer questions that you may have. So if you have questions, feel free to drop them in throughout. We'll be monitoring and trying to pull questions uh, leading up to that time and certainly at that time. As we use the chat, let's remember to be respectful and civil with each other. This is a learning environment. We're here to learn from each other and engage in, in educational dialogue to help each other, right? So try to refrain from tearing people down or using language that is inappropriate. Um, anyone that is not able to adhere to this will be removed from the conversation. All right. Next slide, please, Rachel. Uh, so this, um, Rachel, you want to jump in and introduce yourself while your information is on the screen? Sure. Hi, everyone. I'm going to be co-facilitating today with Chris. Um, I'm really excited to be here. I've been working for Thrive in Your Workplace for almost two years now. And I'm really excited to share with you some of the work we've been doing with the onset of COVID and think about how you all can apply this learning for yourselves and for your teammates and volunteers. So welcome. Thank you for joining us. 
Yes, thank you, thank you. And once again, I'm Christopher Linlogue. You can see my information there on the screen. I am part of the Thriving Workplace team. Uh, very excited to be delivering this training. Um, Rachel, someone, people are having difficult hearing you, so make sure our headsets are, are solid. All right, next slide, please. Right, so real quickly, I wanna take a look at the agenda. So we are going to discuss the impact of COVID-19 on mental health in the workplace and volunteer programs. We're gonna recognize uh, signs and symptoms of mental health challenges. We're also gonna talk about what constitutes a mental health challenge. We're gonna talk about managing stress and anxiety, two of the very most common situations that we all may be feeling as a result of COVID. We're gonna talk about some organizational strategies to support mental health. And lastly, we'll get into some question and answer with you all. Thank you. All right, so when we talk about mental health, it's important to understand it on a spectrum, right? So we all have mental health, just as we all have physical health, right? And it's our state of well-being in which people can cope with the normal stresses of life, right? Work, product, work productively and contribute to their communities, right? So various things can have an effect on our mental health and various things can support our mental health. When we talk about mental health problems, this is really kind of a broad term that recognizes that mental health is a spectrum, right? And so um, these might be the, the, the everyday challenges that a lot of us face, right? Daily stress or stress that's related to COVID or anxiety, uncertainty, you know, social isolation, you know, some of us are feeling lonely or there could even be grief. So these are all mental health problems that we can experience at any given time on any given day. Obviously now during COVID, we may be experiencing more, multiple of these at any given time or to collectively, right? But when we talk about mental illness, it's very important to understand that these are conditions that affect people's thinkings, moods, behaviors, and impacts their day-to-day -day functioning. And so these are persistent, consistent in someone's life, and they have been diagnosed by a mental health clinician, right? So if I'm feeling stressed or anxious about something, it doesn't necessarily mean that I have a mental illness that is related to anxiety, such as an anxiety disorder. It could mean that, but if I haven't been diagnosed by a mental health professional with an anxiety disorder, then I don't necessarily have that mental illness, all right? So it's very important to understand that distinction. So we all have mental health. We all face mental health problems every day. And some of us or some people may have mental illnesses that have been diagnosed and that are persistent through our, our lifetimes, right? <clears throat> Next slide, please, Rachel. And so now that we have this understanding, this general understanding of mental health challenges, um, mental health and mental health challenges, let's talk about how it affects all of us in different ways, especially here in New York City. So in New York City, uh, one in five adults struggle with mental illness every year. So this is diagnosed mental illness. 20% of the population in New York City will be diagnosed with a mental illness in any given year. Right. And so that may be you or someone that, you know, if it's someone that, you know, it has an effect on your life because you have to interact with that person and may be responsible for supporting that person or receiving some support from that person. Right. So suppose it's a family member or a colleague. That is how we interact with people who may be dealing with a mental illness. Right. Suicide is the sixth leading cause of death in New York City. This is also similar to the national average. Right. And suicide sometimes is a result of depression or loneliness or isolation. And sometimes it can be a result of a diagnosed mental illness. Right. Um, over half a million adults in New York are estimated to have depression, yet less than 40 percent report receiving care for it. So this is important to understand. Half a million adults, so 500,000, are believed to have a depression, but less than 40 percent of them are receiving care for it. I don't know my math, but that's probably somewhere around 100,000 or 200,000, right? Somewhere in that area. And this is just of the numbers of people who have reported, right? We know that sometimes mental illnesses or mental health concerns don't go reported, right? And they haven't been diagnosed. And last thing, mood disorders are the third most common cause of hospitalizations for both youth and adults age 18 to 44. And so mood disorders are a form of mental illness that are diagnosed. And it's the third most common cause of hospitalization 
for this age range. And it's important that we single out this age range because this is prime working time. At least people in this age range tend to work a lot. A lot of people in this age range and volunteer a lot, right? And so um, we are all talking about our colleagues that we work with and our um our volunteers that work with us, right? And so they may fall within this age range. Not to say that this is the only age range, but they may fall within this age range. Next slide, please. <clears throat> and so COVID-19, which, you know, by now we're all familiar with, unfortunately, right? In the sense that we've been dealing with COVID since early March, some of us maybe even earlier than that, right? But COVID-19, the pandemic has, um, highlighted or exacerbated mental health concerns, right? So there are things that are more prevalent now because of COVID-19. 85% of workers feel worried or anxious that they themselves may catch COVID-19, right? And this is based on a study done by, I have, the, I have it written down here and I have a note to make sure to, uh, to speak about it. Ah, I can't find it. I'll get the source, but we'll make sure to include the source in the follow-up uh, email, right? 85% um, of people are worried or anxious that they may lose their jobs, right? And so we, uh, we know that COVID has had an effect on the economy, right? And has an effect on people's ability to do their work, but also to maintain their jobs, right? And then 84% of Americans report really struggling with employment-related matters, matters, just as we said. It's a uh, either keeping our job or mental health as it relates to being at work and fear and anxiety about catching COVID, changes that are happening at work. We're not able to retain everyone. So there are differences in how we are have to do the work and managing money and the home, right? And so maybe I'm not able to work the same amount of hours, right? And so that might be affecting our ability to manage money. So COVID-19 has definitely exacerbated and mental health concerns that we may have been feeling on a regular basis, right? Next slide, please. And so, as we mentioned, so the, there are these heightened situ, there are these heightened feelings of mental con mental health concern or problems. And so, we want to just go over some general signs of emotional distress, right? And so, one of the things that we know is, as I mentioned, people are have fear or worrying about their own health or that of their loved ones, right? And so, I'm concerned when I step out about my potential to catch COVID because of myself, I'm worried that I may catch it and I may become very ill and not bounce back, but also because I live very close to my parents and I may come in contact with them or my spouse who's in the same household as me or extended family that we may visit at some point in time, especially now during the holidays, right? Um, so if people are expressing their fear and their worry, this is could be a sign of their emotional distress. Changing in sleeping and eating habits or patterns, right? And so, um, yeah. You know, if if you and your if you know your colleagues can, you know, they have expressed to you that they normally get a certain number of hours of sleep a night and they they eat a certain number of meals. But now things are changing. You know, that could be a sign of their emotional distress. Right. Uh, difficulty concentrating. And that's, you know, we're in a digital era, some of us and have to have our meetings virtually. And that can be an issue in terms of our concentration. But even without a meeting, you know, there might be a couple emails that get missed or a couple tasks that don't get done in the same timely way that they would have prior to COVID. This could be a sign of someone's emotional distress. Uh, worsening of chronic health problems, you know, so if someone is um, someone that experiences health problems, they could be heightened or worsened now be during COVID because access to healthcare may not be the same. Right. You know, previously I was able to go to a physician in person. Now we have to have the virtual meeting. Right. And for some people that may not be enough to sustain their physical health. And the same case goes for mental health. Right. The access to mental health care may not be as strong or readily available in some situations. Right. Because now things are virtual. Sometimes people do need that in-person care. Right. And some other signs of distress could be increased use of alcohol, tobacco, other drugs. Right. Um, so these are some signs, uh, not an exhaustive list, but these are some signs, right? Uh, next slide, please. So in terms of workplaces and mental health's effect or you know, unsupported or untreated mental health's effect on workplaces, here are some data points. You know, research estimates that mental health disorders will cost the nation 16.3 trillion dollars between 2011 and 2013 and 2030 excuse me and so um this is important 
because uh, you know people work and nations need products produced. That's how they you know are able to have money to support their nations. And mental health disorders could be costly if not supported, right? To the tune of sixteen point three trillion dollars, right? Uh, more workers are absent because of stress and anxiety than because of physical Ill illness or injury, right? So more often than not, employees that may miss work or volunteers that may miss their program shift, it could be related to stress and anxiety is more so than a physical illness or injury, right? Whether or not they announce it as stress and anxiety is a different story, but data shows that more workers are absent because of stress and anxiety. Depression is estimated to cost 200 million lost work days each year and uh, cost employers 17 to $44 billion, right? And so same kind of situation, employees or volunteers that don't show up end up costing their employees, their employers, excuse me, money and productivity, right? Um, a recent World Health Organization, as WHO uh, led study, estimated that depression and anxiety disorders cost the global economy one trillion each year in lost productivity. So even if I'm at work, I'm not as productive as I normally could be because of depression or because of anxiety or other mental health issues or illnesses that I may be dealing with, right? Um, so it's very costly for nations and employers if they don't support the mental health of their employees. Next slide, please. And so some of you may be familiar with burnout, right? Um, it's a term that some, you know, some of us have heard, you know, the World Health Organization, WHO, labeled it an occup occupational hazard last year, meaning that is something that all employers should become aware of, right? And so the idea of burnout is a mental and a emotional exhaustion as it relates to work, right? Um, and oftentimes we hear about it in the sense of having too much work, right? We're overworked. Um, but it's not the only thing that can contribute to burnout, right? Um, in in uh, an, anonymous, an anonymous poll of professionals about their experiences, 73% 70, reported burnout at the end of April, which was really kind of the height or the early period of COVID-19 in, in New York City and in the U.S., right? Um, and that was an increase from 61% in mid-February, right before COVID really started wrecking havoc here in the U.S. So there was a 12% increase and potentially due to COVID, right? Why is that? You know, one of the contributors to burnout is this idea of lack of control, right? And so COVID brought about greater uncertainty around every part of the virus response, right? We didn't know what could happen. How could people get sick? You know, how can it, how, how do we, what, how, you know, what am I able to touch? Who am I able to come in contact with? We didn't know how the government would respond. Are they going to impose stricter restrictions? Are they going to ease up? Is their testing going to be available? All of those things contribute to a lack of control right? Which is one of the drivers of burnout. Boundaries between work and home are blurred. So another contributor is role confusion and ambiguity, right? And so those of us that were able to work from home, now things are blurred. I'm at home. My kids are at home. You know, I'm in one room. My wife's in another room. My kids are here. I have a meeting, but I have to get them set up. There is no difference between work and home, right? So it's, it's ambiguity around that right? The, the work day is supposed to be a set number of hours, but now it bleeds over a couple hours, right? And what am I exactly supposed to be doing? Am I the parent in this situation? Am I an employee? You know, am I a colleague? You know, am I a friend? Role confusion, right? Um, shelter at home and isolation. You know, we're a, a, a people people in, in the sense that we love to be around people. So lack of community can lead to burnout is another factor that contributes to burnout. And we're sheltering at home. For those of us that have our family, we do have a sense of community, but family is not our only community. We have the work community, we have friends, we have extended family that we may not be able to interact with. To, so it causes that sense of isolation, right? Which is a contributor. And lastly, the pandemic has affected communities differently. So um, lack of fairness is a contributor to burnout. And as we have seen with the COVID pandemic, it has affected different areas in different ways. Different populations are affected in different ways. It just doesn't seem fair, right? Um, and in, in a large respect, it is not fair. You know, some areas have been grossly underserved, right? We know that. So that lack of fairness could be contributing to our burnout as well. But, you know, there's good news. Mental health support really does help, right? So for employers that work with their colleagues and 
volunteers to support their mental health, there is a positive out outcome, right? Most people who experience a mental health issue or even an illness recover and live full active lives, right? If they receive treatment, right? They're able to function, they're able to carry out their daily responsibilities, they're able to interact with their colleagues, their coworkers, their friends, their, their family. Uh, most individuals with mental health challenges will improve, again, with diagnosis, diagnoses and treatment, right? So if you are experiencing mental health challenges or know someone who may be experiencing mental health challenges, if they're able to receive an appropriate diagnosis, then they're able to receive treatment and they will, you know, they will improve. Their mental health challenges will improve, right? As it relates to work, 80% of employees that are treated for mental health problems report improvements in their job satisfaction and their productivity, right? And so if my employer encourages me and supports my mental health struggles and has resources available or, you know, reduces the stigma around me receiving treatment, then I feel much better about being at that employer or volunteering with that company, right? And that, include, that improves my job satisfaction and my productivity, right? And so um, it's important not to feel defeated about mental illness, about mental health problems, about the stress of anxiety and anxiety, uh, the stress and anxiety related to COVID, because treatment does help, right? And so we're going to talk about ways throughout the rest of the call of how employers and we can help each other. And we'll get into individual resources later as well. So I'm going to turn it over to Rachel, who will get into strategies for managing stress and promoting well-being. Great. Chris, can you give me a thumbs up if I, my audio is okay? You can hear me. I sound good. All right. Thumbs up. Great. All right, thank you everyone again for joining us and thank you, Chris, for that great overview. So while we've presented some sobering statistics, there's a great deal of work that we can do as part of the workplace to support ourselves, our employees and volunteers and our organizations as a whole. We can grow our resilience, which is increasing our capacity to weather and grow from these adverse experiences. But first, we must work on understanding what is happening at this current very difficult moment and what some of that stress might look like in our minds and bodies. So we like to start out with the mental health trifecta for emotional well-being, which we know is something that many of you have heard about many, many times, but it's so important that it really, you know, is worthwhile to continue speaking about it. So there are a couple of important elements to really promote mental health for ourselves as individuals. So the first is social support. And while we are physically distancing, it's really important to make sure that we're staying in touch with our friends and family members and colleagues. Um, I know a Zoom hangout isn't as fun, uh, especially right now with the holidays. I think this is probably gonna be a really tough one, but it's so important for our well-being to think about unique and creative ways that we can continue to maintain our social supports. Exercise and nutrition, again, something we've all heard millions of times throughout our lives, uh, but it's really helpful, especially I think cardio can be really helpful in improving your mood. Maintaining healthy habits, like prioritizing sleep and eating a healthy diet, can really help you, you know, maintain your mental health by helping you create a routine. And now, this is something that comes up a lot in our work, and I wanted to just take a moment to talk more about this routine um, and how it relates to boundaries. So structure can be very grounding. Um, and so staying in tune with your sleeping and eating patterns can help you set up a regular schedule, particularly when working or volunteering from home. Particularly during COVID, the physical boundaries between spaces in which we work and live have disappeared and it can be really challenging to keep work from taking over your home life. Don't do it. Not only will this deplete your energy, lots of research has shown that multitasking doesn't actually work. While it can feel very hard to do, particularly for many of the folks in the room here who are working on really important social services causes, no one will do it for you. And setting boundaries for yourself can also encourage your team in turn to do the same. So we recommend trying to start small. For instance, by letting people know that you'll be working on a grant for the next two hours and will not be available on email. In one of our recent panels, we convened a group of CEOs to talk about how they have been leading during this time. And many mentioned no Zoom Fridays as an example of setting boundaries or no email after work hours. It can feel intimidating to start out with this. So just over communicate with your team, particularly in this virtual environment. Let them know when you're gonna be doing focused work and so that they won't be expecting any email responses for you. So something 
that we realized was really important throughout this process. As Chris mentioned, there's a lot of uncertainty and there's a lot that we can't change. Um, so while we can't change the sort of external actions that are happening around us, other than by social distancing and wearing masks, we can look at our thought patterns and think about what is helping us and what may be causing even more negative thoughts and behaviors to happen. So we wanted to take this model that came from a cognitive behavioral therapist that we had previously worked with in some of our work and explain it to talk about how thoughts can really drive your feelings and it doesn't have to be the opposite way around. So this whole idea of this triangle is called cognitive restructuring. Um, and this is a core technique in cognitive behavioral therapy, which is a very well studied approach to a tre uh, treating common mental health issues. Um, but it can also be just as useful for other folks who may struggle with over overly negative self talk and negative thoughts. It basically means that how we feel emotionally is not necessarily the result of what happens to us, but instead it's the result of how we feel about what happens to us. This means that we can change the way we feel by changing the way we think about what happens to us. And again, I'm not a clinician. It's obviously much more complicated than this. And we'll provide some resources at the end of this training session where you can reach out if you or some of your friends or family members might benefit from a little more clinical support in this area. So CBT emphasizes the relationships between our thoughts and our feelings and our behaviors. More specifically, how our thoughts change the way that we feel, which subsequently changes the way that we act, which then influences our thoughts. Um, here's how the triangle might work in real life. For instance, let's say you woke up feeling tired and groggy today. You have a big presentation and you hate having to speak in front of groups. So your thoughts start up. I'm going to mess up. Everyone's going to hate my presentation. I'm worthless. I should just stay home. So these thoughts often make up internal dialogue that we have within ourselves. So now enter the feelings. After a morning filled with these really negative thoughts and being really hard on yourself, you're feeling even worse. You feel anxious about your presentation and overall you're just feeling really bad about yourself. And the last thing you wanna do now is present. So let's step back. Is it any surprise that our thoughts so directly influence our feelings? The things that we tell ourselves matter. So then comes the behavior. After time spent grappling back and forth with procrastination, you make it out the door and you're starting your presentation, but as you begin, your thoughts are running rampant and you're feeling very anxious. Even though you know your subject matter well, you can't seem to articulate it. And then you might have a hard time in your presentation. How many times have we all done this, gotten ourselves so worked up that we can barely make it through something that is typically well within our capabilities? So then this presentation puts a dent in your confidence, the event justifies those negative thoughts and the whole cycle triangle starts all over. Um, so, you know, another short example, we have a behavior, um, we have a meeting at work to go over a presentation and we receive some negative feedback from our boss, then our emotions, we feel sadness, maybe shame or frustration, and then followed by the thoughts, I can't do anything right, I'm never going to get ahead in life. Um, so, you know, we've all experienced a series of patterns at various times at various points in our life. But it's not until we start to think about this process to interrupt this cycle or question it um, that we can start to change really how our brain thinks about and processes these kinds of things. It can be really hard as many of us have a long history of thinking really tough thoughts about ourselves, but it is possible to instill more healthy ways of thinking, feeling, and behaving. So the next few slides are gonna provide some tips about how to do this uh, using some reframing activities and also thinking about mindfulness. So here are a couple of the types of examples of negative thought patterns. Um, and then we're gonna talk about some strategies for how we can try to combat these negative thought patterns we see. There are a lot of ways that our minds and thinking can play tricks on us. Um, and these are called negative thoughts or more you know, scientifically cognitive distortions. They are beliefs and thought patterns that are irrational, false, or inaccurate, and they have the potential to cause serious damage to our sense of self and our confidence. So, but there are ways that we can learn to identify and modify our default ways of thinking about this. So one example of this is all or nothing thinking. Things are black and white and we don't see any alternatives. So for instance, situations where people are good or bad, everything has to fit in one of two boxes. Uh, 
people are good or bad. Things I do are successful or a failure, perfect or disastrous. And it doesn't take into account the fact that, you know, really most of the things that we do consistently fall into this gray area. Catastrophizing is another type of negative thought patterns. So this is when you might exaggerate the significance of negative aspects to give them more important than is realistic or predict negative incomes outcomes. So an example could be, you know, I get really good feedback from this training, but one person writes me a mean email. And all I do is think about that mean email and that that's really what everyone was thinking about the training, even though I know that lots of people really enjoyed the training itself. This also relates to mind reading. So which is imagining that we know for certain what others are thinking or fortune telling. Um, so for example, my boss thinks I'm just being lazy. My boss feels like I'm not doing any work right now remotely because they can't see me in the office. Um, you know, when in reality, we don't actually have any idea of what, you know, our bosses might be thinking at certain times. And finally, labeling. So you label or judge a specific situation in an extreme way. Sarah is totally irresponsible and never wears a mask. My coworker, Steve, is terrible at his job. There are other types of negative thought patterns, but these are some of the most common ones and ones that we can use similar strategies to think about how we can combat these negative thoughts. So here are a couple of tips for this. Try reframing these negative thoughts. So reframe, I'm stuck inside to I can finally focus on my home and self. And I think as we continue this pandemic, it's gonna become more and more important for us to think about how we can do these reframes as the situation drags out. Um, challenge the thought. So what is the evidence that this is true? So let's say you have a thought that there's nothing I can do to prevent getting COVID. So this is an example of all or nothing thinking, but challenge it. What is the evidence? What is within your control? Can you wear a mask? Can you practice social distancing? You know, don't assume just because you thought that something that it's necessarily true. And also, is there another possibility or explanation or outcome for this? So what do I know to be true right now? So for instance, Everyone thinks I'm incompetent because I made an error during my training. So this is me assuming that I can mind read what everyone else is thinking and also labeling them as, you know, not viewing any sort of gray area in between. So challenge this. So what is the evidence that this is true? You know, have I seen the evaluations that, you know, folks uh, have found value in some of these trainings? You know, have I seen and heard good feedback from my boss on previous presentations and even after this? Um, what else could they be thinking? And here are some additional questions to help challenge some of these negative thought patterns. So what evidence do I have that this is actually true? Am I questioning my worth as a person because of one thing that has happened? Am I worrying about things that I can do something about? And what should I be thinking about right now? And I think this leads very nicely into sort of a related but separate type of strategy that we're going to talk about for addressing some of these negative thoughts, which is mindfulness. Mindfulness is one of these phrases that gets thrown around a lot, but it's something that I think is a really valuable tool, particularly right now when there is so much that's out of our control to really help us think about our thoughts, ask ourselves, is this useful? And then use some of our mindfulness strategies to really help maintain and improve our own mental health. So mindfulness can help us by noticing our anxiety, which is usually a bad time to make decisions, help us distinguish between reasonable fear and anxiety, and also help us face the current situation instead of pushing away you know, some of these really painful thoughts. Um, John, Jack Kornfield, one of the most famous meditation teachers, has said that Buddhists were the first cognitive behavioral therapists. And as you can see, some of these key elements, which include focusing on your current experience, uh, not the past or present, which can be very challenging, particularly right now when we might be thinking about good thoughts in the past or hopefulness in the future. And allowing an experience to occur without judging it to be good or bad, that you know it is what it is and thinking about your physical body and how this moves forward. So mindfulness has a whole host of research that has shown that it's a really effective tool to help us manage our moods and positive emotions. And now we're gonna talk about a specific strategy uh, to really help us do this in the real world. I think it's also very important to note that as leaders and organizations or managers, 
people can tell when we are not taking care of our own headspace. And it's really important to make sure that we are able to bring ourselves to work in the best way possible to really show our employees and volunteers that they can do that as well. And that this is something that we're all experiencing together. So I find the acronym RAIN, which was developed by Tara Brock, a famous Buddhist psychologist, helpful for thinking about how to apply mindfulness in the moment. So the R stands for recognize. Recognize means consciously acknowledging the thoughts and feelings or behaviors that are affecting us. It's really just noticing that you're experiencing something which may be good or bad and stepping out of yourself for a moment. Uh, so the example I like to use is, let's say you get an email from your boss that's asking you about something that one of your employees or volunteers was supposed to do and they didn't do. You know, your first reaction will probably, you know, not be really great. Um, and taking this moment to really just recognize, oh, I feel upset can really help you respond with wisdom and skill instead of, you know, sending off a really, you know, kind of mean email to your employee or volunteer that's probably not going to get you the result that you want. From there, you want to allow the experience to really occur as it is without trying to fix it. So one thing I've heard a lot when speaking with many folks who are working in the types of social service or nonprofit agencies um, is that they can really be feeling burned out and then make themselves feel worse about the burnout that they are feeling. You know, um, they feel worse because they're feeling disengaged, even though allowing that part of themselves uh, instead of beating yourself up about it can really help you overcome your burnout and think about how to skillfully respond to whatever the situation is that is occurring. And then investigate with kindness. So now we explore these feelings or sensations that we're having. You can start to look at the body. So are you feeling tense? Where are you holding it? Is it in your jaw? Is it in your chest? You know, it can be really helpful to sort of uh, start this out focusing on the body. And then you can also think about your mind. You know, I'm feeling worried about my job. I'm worried that my boss, you know, is going to think I'm incompetent because of this, you know, thing that my employer volunteer didn't do. So, you know, just see like, what am I feeling right now? And then nurture with self-compassion. Don't be so hard on yourself. Is there something you can do versus just getting up and taking a stretch or getting a cup of tea? Um, or really just showing yourself compassion and saying, hey, you know, I missed a deadline, it's okay. Here's what I'm gonna do to fix it. And I'm not gonna, I know that I'm a good employee and you know, a good human being and I'm not gonna let this one thing sort of keep me down. So another quote that I like to use talking about mindfulness is that if your compassion does not include yourself, it is incomplete. And I think I always really try to, you know, strive to, make sure that folks are hearing this message because I think it's so important for ourselves and for managing our other team members. Because if we can show up in this way, you know, it gives space for them to try to show up this way as well. So now I wanna to touch on some organizational approaches to promote mental health in the workplace and for volunteer programs. So I think, you know, we've just talked a lot about some individual strategies that we can use about, you know, thinking about our thought patterns and using some meditation or mindfulness techniques. But again, we work in organizations and there are a lot of environmental factors that can either promote mental health um, or, you know, take away from mental health. So some of the things that we can do are to increase just general awareness about mental health in our organizations name the issue and educate employees and volunteers about signs of mental health challenges. Um, there can be frequent communication about resources for mental health for employees. This might include insurance or employee research groups, um, or you might have meetings with employee champions who really wanna share feedback about what mental health is and why it's so important to get care. I think just naming the issue and helping people realize that treatment really does work can be such a really important first step. Build a foundation of organizational support. So this is really leading with compassion for those of you who manage teams or maybe you're even leaders in your organization. Model the behaviors that you wish to see. You know, practice supportive compassion for yourself. You know, you can say to folks, I am going to take a walk during my lunch break. You know, I'm going to go grocery shopping during the senior hours, which are at, you know, two to four today so that I'm not going to be in a really crowded grocery store. Model this so that people know that it's okay that they can take care of themselves in this way as well. Show appreciation. 
I think right now, especially with remote work, it can be challenging, uh, you know, that we don't have those sort of informal social interactions together where you might say, great job, you know, that that report looked really good or, you know, thank you for picking up the coffee for the office. I really appreciate that. Um, but it's so important and really goes such a long way in improving those um, employee, manager and volunteer bonds. And communicate consistently and openly about organizational goals and priorities to reduce anxiety and provide clear guidance. This is something we talked a little bit more about in our last training on collective trauma. But, you know, when people are in these traumatic experiences right now, like we all are, we all, as Chris mentioned, feel out of control. And so showing control where you can, even if it's saying answers that you don't know, such as letting folks know, we do not have a deadline for returning to the office. We will keep you up to date and let you know as these decisions occur, uh, can be really helpful in alleviating some of that anxiety. And even if you know, you're not giving folks the answer that they really want to have, at least they understand where you are and what is going on in the organization. And finally, creating opportunities for social support. So relationships are a key part of both mental and physical health. Social support gives us the feeling of being loved and cared for and belonging to a group. And a strong social support system can improve or protect mental health and decrease symptoms of depression and anxiety. There are a variety of ways to do this that we touched on in our last presentation, uh, which you can also access a recording of. Um, but some of the most common ones are about uh, employee champions, who are people who feel really passionate about mental health in the workforce and share those um, ideas with other staff members, or employee resource groups, which are groups of employees who kind of come together around a shared characteristic, such as being veterans, to share resources and social support. You also just want to facilitate access to mental health resources. For those of you who are working with other employees, really share information about the different benefits programs. For COVID, many insurance companies changed their benefits, and so you really want to make sure folks know if there are additional counseling sessions they can access or new resources that are available. And we will also be sharing some free resources at the end of this that you can share widely with your friends and family and volunteers. So addressing mental health at work has a cascading impact. So your attitudes and actions as a manager or team leader can really create a ripple effect among your employees and volunteers and set the tone for creating a workplace culture where it is okay to talk about mental health. Your staff and your volunteers are your greatest asset. When they feel confident and engaged in their work, it boosts morale and productivity. But, and this is key, by managing and supporting your own mental health, you create the space to support both your direct reports and affect their lives both at work and at home. And so with that, we would love to answer some questions um, and see what folks have said in the chat. So I will open it up and if there are any questions that came in, um, but also everyone, please send your questions into the chat. Um, okay, <clears throat> so there's a question that came in. Oh, let me put my video on so people can see me. There's a question that came in. <clears throat> Will you be touching on how we can discuss possible mental health issues with our employees without crossing the line? Um, and so I'll start and Rachel, you'll jump in on this. So Perfect. we didn't cover this today, but we do have a webinar, a couple webinars about managing for managing for mental health. And one of the uh, and on the webinars, one of them is how to engage in this conversation with your employee. Actually, we have a couple webinars that could be helpful that can be found on our TWP website. Um, one risk accommodations and uh, risk accommodations and I forget the title, full title, but it it does speak about how you can have a conversation with employees around mental health and do so in a safe legal way, but also in a productive way. We have managing for mental health, uh, supportive managing practices. Uh, so a lot of webinars and resources on how to engage in these conversations. Rachel, do you want to add anything in? Yeah, I would just say we're going to touch on this also in more detail next week when we talk about sort of management and performance management. So it's, you know, if you think someone may be experiencing a mental health challenge, how can you talk to them exactly without crossing a line and in a supportive way and really navigate them towards resources? So, you know, for those who are interested, please stay tuned and come back for next week. Yes, um, all right. Uh, it looks like there's another question. Will you be providing examples of activities employee, employers can provide for employees and volunteers? Um, so I can start out with just some ideas that I think you're asking about different ways to sort of talk about mental health in the workplace. Um, but then, you know, please 
uh, add or clarify in the comments if that's not what you were asking. I think some of the social support activities that we talked about last week and touched on briefly can be really helpful ways to engage folks. Um, you know, so identifying program champions, people who feel very passionate about mental health, who can really sort of model that it's okay to talk about in the workplace. Um, employee resource groups. So creating these sort of affinity spaces where people can come together around a shared characteristic and talk about mental health and also, you know, provide additional resources. Um, and finally, just sort of general wellness committees. And Chris, I'll actually, you're sort of part of our social support committee. Do you want to talk about some activities you've done to increase social support? Yeah. So we recently, um, <clears throat> we recently had a Halloween party virtually. Um, so we are working remote. We were able to get everyone together for a Halloween um, party. And, you know, people came dressed in uh, costumes and engaged or shared photos of, of previous costumes. So, you know, different things to celebrate the holidays. We know we have a couple holidays coming up. Uh, so there could be office get together, virtual potluck in the sense that people get together and just showcase a meal that is of uh, their tradition of how they celebrate with their family. Um, so, you know, anything that you may think about doing in the office or in a physical space, you can try to do virtually. Um, yeah. So we've heard things of that. We've also seen like office watch clubs where there's a particular show and people who watch that show get together on a, on a virtual meeting to discuss what happened on the latest episode or a movie or what have you. Um, and then we've heard some very creative things such as, um, uh, what am I thinking of? Talent show. So one oh. partner that we worked with, they did a virtual talent show. So they had people submit videos uh, of their particular talent. And then they organized a day where, hey, we're all going to get together on this day at 8 p.m. And people are going to demonstrate their talent and we're going to vote via poll to see who had the greatest talent or who performed strongly. So there's definitely lots of different ways to engage people socially. I mean, it's important to try to create that atmosphere because we don't have that in the office, right? We're not getting together as frequently as we could be. We don't have cooler talk. We don't have people walking by the office just engaging in random dialogue. So trying to create those spaces digitally can be very helpful if you are in that situation. For Even for those of us who are still working, because some people are still physically going into workspaces, maybe you can set up a digital situation when people return home, right? Or at a certain part of the day, just so that we can all get together in a non-work related way and have fun, right? So that's an option. Um, I'll add one more. So we actually have a short evaluation that we would really appreciate if folks could fill out. If Chris, you could launch that poll um, while we keep talking about some of these questions. Uh, but it really helps us out with our work to be able to uh, sort of, you know, see what people found helpful. And I also want to say thank you to all the comment section. I really appreciate all the kind words folks are saying. Um, and for someone who mentioned you know, that once they saw us talking about burnout, that it helped identify how they're feeling. I feel you. I think when I learned about burnout in this past work, it really, I was like, oh, this is why I feel so just disengaged when I'm at work and it's taking me, you know, uh, months and months to get, you know, approval on, you know, just some form that, you know, I feel like should take a lot, you know, shorter time. And I understand more now how that can really weigh on someone. Um, so thank you all for your kind comments. Um, one more activity we found that just Chris reminded me is that uh, one of our partners did a sort of virtual farm tour of like animals and stuff, which I thought was really cute with the staff. Um, and we heard uh, someone recently did virtual fall foliage tour, you know, like they were on a virtual train ride looking right. at leaves and stuff like that. So um, there's some options out there that can yeah. be fun and engaging for, for you and your community. Absolutely. So I don't see any more questions. A couple of folks have asked. The slides will be shared as will a presentation. Um, and I just really want to thank you all again. We'll stay on here. Please fill out our evaluation poll. It really helps us. Uh, thank you, Evan and Jamaica. Um, and everyone have a great day.